This episode is brought to you by Air France. I recently flew Air France for Paris Fashion Week, and let me tell you, the experience was sublime. From free champagne in every cabin, meals designed by French chefs on board, and their in-flight entertainment, the French culture is truly infused in every aspect of the flight and made my experience one to remember. The best part? Air France flies to over 200 destinations from the U.S. See you in the sky. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Friend of a Friend podcast. I'm your host, Olivia Perez. Today, I am so excited to have a dear friend of mine on the pod, Hannah Bromfman. At just 31 years old, Hannah has established herself as a health and wellness guru with over half a million followers. She's the founder of HB Fit, a wellness destination dedicated to her discoveries in health, beauty, and fitness. She's also an international DJ, working with brands like Bulgari, H&M, and American Express. She just released her first book, Do What Feels Good, a wellness encyclopedia of her favorite recipes that challenges us to rethink our ideas of beauty and what healthy means to us. Hannah has been a close friend of mine and a mentor to me since the beginning of my career, so I'm really excited to have her on the pod today because she's a true testament to the entrepreneurial spirit and always keeps it real. In this episode, Hannah gives us the good, bad, and the ugly of her journey. From coming face-to-face with failure, to then creating a global community that's challenging beauty and health standards, to her thoughts on how we can build a more inclusive wellness industry. Plus, we divulge some of the best advice she's ever given me as a young entrepreneur. Here's my friend, Anna Bronfman. Hi, doll. So excited to have you on today. Uh, Thank you. I'm so proud of you that you've got a pod going. This is awesome. Thanks. You know, I'm excited to kind of be able to bring together our friends and excited networks and just really dive deep into what their entire career trajectory has been like and I love kind it. of debunk a lot of the mysteries behind it and have honest, raw conversations. So, so important. I feel like it's a, such an inspiring conversation for so many women who are looking to launch their own careers and don't necessarily like know where to start or having challenges. But I want to start at the beginning, um, specifically your upbringing. Just because being a friend of yours, I've loved getting to meet your eccentric, eclectic family. And I think that that has so much to do with like who you are today as an entrepreneur. Can you kind of tell us little anecdotes about your childhood that have a really big impact on who you are today? Yeah, sure. So, um, I mean, if you do follow me on social media, you know that I have like a very strong, opinionated, eclectic, beautiful black mother who goes by Sherry Peaches. Um, And she like has definitely from the beginning instilled such a sense of self in me um, and kind of has always been such a champion of mine and really kind of was a huge advocate for me doing whatever I was super passionate about, Um, whether that was art and you know going to art school or becoming a DJ or an entrepreneur I wanted to be a dancer when I was really little and my mom was super supportive yeah she's always kind of just showed me by example that you can really create your destiny she grew up in the south side of Chicago in the 50s and when she wanted to be an actress singer model um, her family was not very supportive at all which led her to then leaving Chicago, coming to New York kind of with no support system and really forced her to kind of make it on her own, which she did. Um, But she was definitely very cognizant of the way her family treated her when she wanted to pursue her goals. And so, you know, the way she brought me up was very much in a supportive environment. And then on the flip side, my dad is a businessman through and through, born and raised New Yorker. And it's funny because he and my mom are such opposites. And they did divorce when I was two years old, so I've never really known them together, which is kind of insane because I can't even imagine them together. But they they were together for fifteen years before before they divorced. So, but my dad has kind of always been an amazing stand up guy. You know, he does things. He's a businessman, but he also has passion within his business, and it's not so cut or dry. He's, you know, he's he's sensitive, he's stubborn, he's ahead of his years, and he used to be a songwriter, actually. My dad was writing songs for Dionne Warwick at the time, and my mom was in an off-Broadway 
play with Dion. So my dad came to see the play and that's where he first laid eyes on my mom. Um, And it's funny because just the other day I was having a book signing uptown and a bunch of my mom's friends came and some of the the women that were there, they were part of the Cotton Club dancers and they had gone on a tour in Europe and they were telling me stories about when my parents first met, my dad was like flying to Florence to like woo my mom while she was on this tour on the Cotton Club. And so these women who, by the way, I've never heard that story before in my life. And so I was like, ladies, I need, I know I'm like, ladies, I need to take you out for a drink and hear (laughs) more of these stories. It's amazing. Um, So yeah, so my dad is definitely like, um, you know, sensitive, romantic, but he's also a bit cutthroat. And I've seen, you know, him and his brothers and his father, uh, kind of created companies and a legacy for our family out of nowhere. My great grandfather was a bootlegger um, from Canada and created a, a whiskey company, and so they've just showed me what hard work and perseverance can look like, um, and what you can really accomplish when you work hard at 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 your dreams. So fast forward, I didn't necessarily know what I wanted to do. And the world of wellness kind of fell into my lap because I was like DJing all the time and I was so burnt out. And um, I really kind of wanted to feel better. I wanted my skin to look better. I just like wasn't taking care of myself at all. And so I kind of went down this little path of like my own journey of self-discovery. And I just became like fully obsessed with the world of wellness. And it's funny because even as a young girl in the ballet world, like I've been a consumer for so long and the first, you know, the first interactions I had with makeup were stage makeup. You know, the first um, things that I was really doing with my hair was like slicking it down, pinning it up and putting it into a bun on the top of my head. So I was constantly already interacting with the outside physical, how I looked and all that type of stuff in a in a young way and now I was really kind of looking to take that to a deeper more inward journey it's Um, funny I we talked about about this before because I grew up dancing as well mm -hmm. and it's interesting how I think dancing as a kid almost prompts you to force yourself into some sort of spotlight and be okay in that and know know your worth and know your voice right but it also skews your perception of reality a lot totally which is why I think it's so interesting you're now in beauty and wellness Mm. the world of ballet he taught me so much that I I love and I'm like so grateful for and it also taught me a lot that I've had to unlearn in my adult years. Absolutely. But so after high school, you obviously grew up here, you went to Bard. Mhm, I did. What did you study at Bard? So at Bard I actually studied fine art. I was a sculpture major. Um, and it was really because I had gone to a school um, called Poly Prep in New York for my last two years, where I even discovered that I was good at sculpture. Um, I was more focusing on ceramics when I was in high school. Um, but then when I went to college, I started focusing on large scale installations like with mixed media. Um, and it's funny because I also am a first generation college grad um, in my family. So I was super proud and excited to go through school in four years and um, kind of come out the other side. What I wasn't anticipating was graduating in the height of the economic decline and not having any real skill set of which was going to help me in the re- real world, right? And it wasn't it's, it wasn't a time to be a starving artist. So It's funny you talk about the idea of skill set. I think about this often where it's like, do you think entrepreneurship is based off of a skill set or do you think it's something that you're born with and and cultivate over your life. I think you're born with it and you cultivate it over your life. I think if there's anything I've learned about being an entrepreneur, it's like the skill set can be learned and in fact your team should have all the skills that you don't have. Right. So out of school, obviously did you did you start a job or was that when you were just kind of feeling it out and seeing what you wanted to do? So It was actually the years leading up to school that I had summer jobs, mostly in PR, um, some in the fashion world and some in the music world. Um, And some were large corporate and some were very small. Like I worked at Michael Kors, I did Ralph Lauren, and then I even went to a really small company called Kiki de Montparnasse. And then on the flip side in the music world, I worked at Warner and I also worked at Universal. Note to the audience, if you have no idea what you want to do, 
get a job or an internship in, in PR at some point in your life it, because it teaches you how to communicate with people and really lets you see like every single angle of every industry, no, the good it, and the bad. It's seriously so true. I mean, you learn to understand what consumers are looking for. You learn how to understand marketing language. You learn how um, to deal with talent. You learn how to deal with corporate clients. Like you deal with all of these different aspects of, um, you know, I don't know, consumerism and branding on a whole that can be applied to to so many different things, right? And so when I left school, I was DJing. I had been DJing at school. I had been DJing in the city during summers, but then I was going back to school. Um, And then when I left school, I literally was like, all right, I'm just going to you know, no one corporate, I'm not, I'm not looking to get another PR job in, in corporate America. Um, and so I went around literally knocking on door to door of nightclubs, introducing myself to people, you know, and at that time there was no social media, right? So I don't have a profile. No one knows me. Like, you know, I hadn't, I couldn't say like, hey, I've DJed at this place in the city. Like some of the places that I DJed over the summer were willing to like give me like references, but like what club owners like really calling another person to like hear whether or not you like did a good set or something. So that just like wasn't what, it wasn't how it was working back then. So I remember my friends, Matt and Carlos, who had opened the Jane, um, I was like begging them to have me DJ a party. And they were like, all right, well, you know, I'll see, let me look at the schedule. Next thing you know, they get a cancellation. I'm getting a call an hour before set time. They're like, we need you here in 20 minutes. I was like, I stopped everything. I like literally grabbed all my shit, went to the Jane. I was, I remember thinking to myself, I don't know this um, system. And so I literally got a 10 minute tutorial before my set time. And I'll never forget like that night, we did not shut down the bar until about five in the morning. Oh my God. People were on top of couches, dancing like crazy. It was so fun. And Matt and Carlos were just like, I could see they were like my big brothers. They were so proud of me. And they were like, all right, like next week you're here again. I love and that. just like started from it was, there. It was a very lucky kind of right timing, right place moment. Oh my gosh, totally. Which I hear a lot of in a lot of like the entrepreneurship stories that we've been featuring. Timing is everything. Do you believe in luck? I do believe in positivity. I think that if you put positive thoughts, feelings, um, and beliefs into the world, that the world will give you that back. Some people could perceive that as luck, but I think it's a little bit more manifesting than just pure luck. Agreed. I think it's 50-50. You have to put in the work to get to receive the luck. Totally. I think you're not just going to walk around blindly and suddenly get lucky. Exactly. Yeah. But so during this time, you also were working on an app called Beautified. Yes. Oh, my God. Okay. So I like to preface this with this is my – this was my MBA into business. It was – it was everything, and I look back on it thinking, like, I wouldn't have changed one single thing about it. So I'll preface it like that. But so Beautified um, was an app that booked last-minute beauty appointments through a curated list of salon and spas. Genius idea, by the way. Um, thank you. Mm-hmm. And I, when I came up with it, I was like, wow, how is this? I actually used it at the time that it was launched. Oh, amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I literally thought to myself, how does this not exist? Um, Uber had just launched maybe a year before that. Um, There was no Glam Squad. There was no Priv. Um, The only thing that really was around at the time was a company called Van Set, and they were really focusing on in-home, right? We wanted the hotel tonight of the beauty industry. Right. So we... I found my co-founder, Annie. Um, then Annie and I found a third co- co-founder, a guy named Peter. And the three of us then found our CTO. Uh, we found a designer. And we just got this whole thing, like, from the ground up. We did not necessarily know what we were up to. But I knew the beauty industry. We knew that we could pound the pavement and sell this product, right? At the time, it was a proprietary software. Um, people weren't loving mind body at the time and it was still early days, um, of the mind body world. So we were going around salon to salon, two girls selling it. Peter was kind of running the, the back end side of things with the tech and the designer. Um, but you know, we all 
we all like put our heart and soul into this UX and and the whole thing, right? Um, the user experience of it all and and everything. So, and then we raised money, and then we ended up having a massive falling out. And you know what? It's actually so nice to talk about this experience now um, because there are so many things that have happened in the last couple of years with just like women's voices rising in the workplace that I wasn't even aware of that I had to deal with on a day-to-day basis. But it be, it got so bad with this guy, Peter, who literally not only bullied us, right, but then also um, bullied us with, with equity, right? Every time we wanted to have an equity conversation, it was like, you know, his temper went through the roof. It was like very much an emotional abusive relationship that we that Annie and I found ourselves in and we How did you guys handle that? Or combat so, that in the moment? So in the moment it was very much like let the tantrum happen and almost be like look at yourself. Like this is outrageous. This isn't how normal business people talk to each other. It's not how um it got so bad that we actually were asking him to not come to certain meetings because his whole persona and, and like being rubbed people the wrong way a lot of the money that we raised actually was um well all the money that we raised was through Annie and I but a lot of the money that we raised was also contingent on the fact that like Peter might like be bought out at some point and leave the company um and so honestly it got to a point where it was so bad that we Annie and I went to our investors and we said listen this is the this is the situation that we're in it's very uncomfortable we don't want to spend time at the office and because he's trying to do all of our jobs for us by micromanaging and not doing it well because we all know as entrepreneurs that you can't take on everything and that it's quite important that you stay in your lane and you let your team really bring you up. Um, That was not the case there. And so we said to our investors, listen, we are in a position where this is going to die unless we we've we changed something so we were kind of like staging a coup with our investors and um with our legal and everyone and then when it came time for us to pull the trigger and serve those papers literally it was like some sort of red flag went off on his end and 20 minutes before we could serve those papers i was being delivered the same set of papers from him and I was locked out of my account, my email account. I was literally suspended from the back end portal. I had no access to anything and he completely cut off Annie and I both from this company. And I was devastated. I'm like, here I am thinking I had all of my ducks in a row and then I'm fully blindsided. But not to mention, like, again, all the money came with us, right? So like this guy was about to like, go down drowning unless like I could kind of figure out and Annie could kind of figure out some sort of soft landing right okay so we teed up a few soft landings none of which kind of included him in in that what the next phase of the soft landing was like whether we were to be acquired and they would want Annie and I to come on board and Peter to not like those were the conversations we were having and of course none of those uh, solutions were good enough for him and his ego because he wasn't going to be a part of the company anymore. So eventually he, you know, went down with the dying ship. I spent a lot of money in legal fees trying to gain access back to my company. And he just had us in, you know, loopholes, you know what I mean? Like chasing an invisible, you know, situation. And so I finally had to walk away from it. And it took about a year for me to emotionally get over this, um, what felt like, it, it, I don't want to say breakup. It felt like someone stole my child. It felt like I had been a part of a kidnapping. And it was like I went through the denial, the jealousy, the rage, like all of the things. It took me literally maybe a little bit more than a year to stop thinking about this guy every single day, right? And even now, however many years later, what, seven years later, I think about him like once every month. There is – unfortunately a stigma against entrepreneurs right now that I think we've built ourselves where it's a constant highlight reel and there really isn't a lot of what's going on in the background right. what are all these like terrible moments that we're dealing yeah. with day in and day out and this was a big one for you 
you're always very open about it in every interview, even when I first met you and you told me about it. This was like one of those defining moments for me where I literally thought to myself, how the hell am I going to pick myself up again? What are people going to think of me? Like, I'm this failed entrepreneur. What am I without this company? Like, who, like, literally, who am I? Well, because as entrepreneurs, we attach our worth to our work totally. so heavily. Totally. Because it is us. It's a manifestation of us. It's our thoughts and ideas manifested in real life. Right. If you were to look back on that situation now as a stronger and bigger entrepreneur, is there some is there a way that you would have responded differently to the situation? Well, there were red flags everywhere from the moment that we met this human and if I being who I am now, I would have just never gone into business with him. I'm lucky to be honest that it happened all when it did, A, because I was so young, B, because the industry was so ripe for innovation and we were really at the forefront there, and C, because honestly, it was so much easier to raise money then. Anyone and their mother was giving money out to a consumer a consumer brand. Um, and so if they were like, doesn't matter that you're not making money, like you've got you've got users, you know, you've got info, like we're down. And I'm like, okay, cool. But at the same time, you know, I think if I had realized how much were to come with the idea of raising money and knowing that, you know, you have all these other people now that you are that you have to report to, um, you know, it's a lot of it's a lot of pressure to hit your goals and to make sure. So I would have been a li- maybe a little bit slower in that process. But again, like we were eager to prove ourselves. We were eager to show that we were players in the space. And I think now knowing and seeing the landscape of of the trajectory of these you know startups and small businesses, raising venture capital is not always the best thing to do. And it shouldn't be a signal of how well a company is doing. We're so, we eat so much on this company raised this much money on this evaluation. There's and so much weight on it. There's so much weight on it. And a lot of times they're just using it as a press piece to like get into TechCrunch. You and I live in such a numbers game, I think, in both the beauty and fashion space where it's like your social number, your following numbers, what and like how much money you're getting and what your company is like valued at. Like totally. it's all about the number. Totally. Um, and I hope that that changes over the next couple of years. I Me really too. Do. Honestly, I, th- I think we're already starting to see a shift um, change of, around the numbers. I think it's really starting to prove itself that doesn't matter the numbers, but it really matters about the quality and what you're talking quality about. Or quantity. Yeah, and 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 engagement, right? Like, I don't care if someone has twenty thousand followers if they have an engaged community and like people are really listening to what this person is That's saying. That's the most interesting to me. Same. I love looking through people's comments and seeing how engaged their audience is and what they're saying. Yeah, me too. That close knit community is so enticing to me, knowing that that exists online and the fact that you can potentially take that offline and oh. actually build a group of people um, is like it's amazing. Mind blowing it really me. is. And honestly, yeah. like that that online to offline connection is everything. And I have been I have been so humbled by the experience I've had over the last three months on my book tour. Like I'm same literally speechless watching your stories and seeing the amount of people that show up no, is it's, really incredible. It's crazy. Yeah. And not only that show up that are there to tell me the wildest shit. Like, they really feel like they are, we are best friends, and that I'm, like, in on all of their secrets, too, and I'm, like, hearing firsthand about, you know, whether it's health-related, relationship, um, you know, whatever it is, community-driven, like, all these things, I'm hearing everything from these amazing, smart, educated women who are showing up for this IRL experience. But so when was the moment that you picked yourself back up again to start HB Fit? Now that we're on the whole book tour conversation. Yeah, sure. So honestly, I, I'll never forget. I um, So at the same time that Beautified was like basically like dying a slow death, um, this thing called Instagram was like starting to like pop off a little bit. Never like, heard of it. Yeah, never heard of it. <laughs> Um, And it was like, I was just posting, like, I don't know, just, like, 
recipes and workouts and just like my lifestyle. I was just posting stuff and I was using this hashtag called HB Fit. And I realized that I was going out at night and my friends were calling me HB Fit and my friends were suddenly asking me like, oh, what was that? workout you did today or what was that recipe you posted or who was that doctor you saw and I'm like these are my friends who never once like cared anything about what I was like talking about and now all of a sudden they're like it's like obviously a sticky conversation and they want to know more and I was like okay well if this is happening within my friends maybe it's happening a little bit further out now that I understand that this device can give you reach and so things just started to like kind of pick up in the HB fit like hashtag. So I was like, maybe I should start its own Instagram. Maybe it should have its own .com. Like maybe it should be this like community for people who want to explore everything there is to know in wellness. Um, I was very aware also of like HB fit being my initials with fitness, but I was also very aware that It was health, beauty, and fitness. I was always kind of aware of this double kind of branding situation, like using myself to kind of make it a little bit like pop off in the beginning and then kind of rebrand so it could like live beyond me. Right. That was kind of the goal and that's that's what I was able to do. I like that mentality a lot because I think the idea of – there's a stigma against rebrands, I feel like. Yes. And I started my website when I was 20. I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. Yeah. I did it as, like, a fun thing in college. Yeah. And, like, halfway through, I was like, well, this isn't me anymore. This doesn't feel like me. I've grown. I've evolved. I want my company to evolve with me. Mm -hmm. And now I'm kind of in the process of I'm literally mid-rebrand where we're, like, amping the site back up and our Instagram back up to help facilitate these conversations that we're recording. Totally. And it's interesting. um, You know, I'm happy to hear you talk about the fact that you went into it knowing that it was going to grow different evolutions because I feel like there's been so much like pressure on me and young entrepreneurs as they're growing their brands to like stay the same. Totally. We're HB Fit's about to go through another change in stage because honestly, we want to be there for the needs of our community and those needs are changing. Always. Right? And they're evolving and as we kind of explore the landscape of um of the wellness world specifically you know, e-commerce and blogs and kind of media companies. It's like, it's just, it's so interesting to me that to see where everyone else is kind of shaken out that have the VC backing and that have all the ability to hire a lot of people. Like we're still operating at such a small, um, comparatively small uh, operation like we still have like it's such a small team like we still have the ability to pivot and change um I haven't pumped like a lot of money into HB Fit that's something I'm always curious about when you first launched was there a specific area within your company that you pumped money into that you knew would be important for growth so we it, yes and that was content but again I wasn't even like pumping money into it it was just like all right, we were taking so much content, like this is all, this is here. But like we weren't, I I didn't pump money into it in a way of scaling, right? Like I wasn't like, okay, I'm going to hire seven people to create the content arm of my company. Like I don't have money to sustain seven people's salaries, you know? So it's like, it was a slow and steady organic growth, which is why I think our community is so loyal to us, right? Is because I haven't gone after VC money and I haven't said, listen, we're going to have a sales team. We're going to put out a product. We're going to have a a content arm. Um, We're going to start running ads on on the site. You know, a lot of that also, like I look at companies that kind of were starting around the same time as me, like a man repeller, and they've just skyrocketed, right? And it's amazing what she was able to do, but also she had like large numbers and large traffic and was really able to sustain that on the advertising side and we were still small and I wasn't you know I'm I'm not necessarily putting dollars behind promotion and running ads on the site yet because you know I for whatever reason I I want it to stay as authentic and as tight as possible um and I like the I I like that by the way I like that I have the ability you have a very dedicated community very dedicated and I like that we have we are so small and nimble and that we can pivot and change um as long as we are as long as we are communicating with our 
community about that and how we're going to do that to better service them. I think as long as you're transparent in that, like that's totally fine. And you know what? I've seen so many other media brands and stuff blow up in the wellness world. A lot of them have backlash. A lot of them like the content isn't good. Um, and they and it's just because they've scaled so quickly and like you know they're not putting as much thought and effort into um, into the content and into their community. I was on Instagram the other day and I saw that you were on a panel and you were talking about the best piece of advice your men a mentor gave to you. Mm -hmm. And I love what you had to say. You said, don't romanticize your business. Can you unpack that a little bit for us? Yeah, so this actually, those words of wisdom literally came to me through my father when I was like being sued by this ex-partner and I was so upset. I, I, I said, you know, dad, I've worked so hard on this and like it's just gone. I don't have, I can't, I have no access to my back end. I, you know, by the way, I was the front person in that business, right? It was my picture and my name next to the article about the company. So this was my reputation on the line. You so know what I mean? So it was deeply personal as Yeah. Well. And so, and my dad just said, you know, you cannot fall in love with your business. You have to be able to be strong. You are a person with or without that company. Um, and, I'll never forget, I mean, side, this is going off topic, but I'll never forget like the true moment where I realized that not only did I need to start HB Fit, but I needed to do something for myself was when, you know, I, I spent a lot of time thinking of horrible things to do to this person, right, who me over. Um, and one of the many ideas that I was Hannah. yeah I know <laughs> it was really dark it was a dark time and one of the many things that I thought of I had said out loud to my boyfriend at the time who is now my husband and he shout said out shout out to Brendan who always knows the right thing to say to me it's he crazy said, it is crazy he knows the right thing to say always anytime always I know it like, is wild something random's going on in my life B is like one of the first people I call. I call and I'm like, what do I do in this situation? I know. And he always has the best thing to say. It's so like, it's he's very wise. Anyway, so I was like telling him some like plotting thing that I was like up to. Um, and he was like, this is crazy. You can't spend all this energy putting into like a negative thought process in your body he's like you need to forget about this guy I'm like but how the hell can I forget about this guy when I just want to like I literally want to kill him like what do I do and he was like the best revenge you're ever going to get on this guy is for you to be so successful that he sees your face everywhere I was like I was like, oh, my God. The best revenge is success. You are so right. And I was like, you know what? I have I have been focusing so much negative energy on this over here when all of a sudden this over here, I'm pointing my cell phone right now because the community and the buzz and the noise that was going on on my Instagram with HFit, it's like it had been knocking me in the face saying, hey, pay attention to me. Put your positive energy into growing this. See what happens there. And it like literally did. It like sparked this whole new resurgence of uh, what I kind of knew in my heart I wanted to do, which was like, you know, be a leader in this community and really showcase, you know, my lifestyle and kind of debunk health issues and like health trends and whatnot and kind of just be like a voice for the millennial girl who like wants to not necessarily buy into everything that is being marketed to her, um, asking deeper questions and etc. And so in that moment, that was the exact motivation I needed to really like f refocus my energy on myself and give new life to like HB Fit and see what could come from that. And I didn't necessarily know what was going to come from it. I just knew that I needed to start paying attention to it and putting real energy and work into it because th to then even see what the potential could be. How did you find your rhythm on on Instagram? Because I think. At that moment in time, you're probably looking at it like, okay, I'm going to pay attention to it. I'm going to give it that that time and energy. But when I look at your Instagram now, you literally have created a, an entire narrative out of your life. And I see that there are different po like different pockets of topics you talk about in your own life. Mm -hmm. And people want to see that, whether it's your mm -hmm. nails, whether it's like you and Brendan, whether it's food, workouts. Mm -hmm. Was there something in that beginning that was very indicative to you of the way you've created a rhythm now? All that really sticks out to me is that I was 
showcasing the nails. I was doing the recipes. I was in the gym. I was actually, I want to say when I was working out then, I was way more about being in the gym and showing people what I was doing in the gym as opposed to like going to boutique fitness classes and whatever. Um, And so I don't know. I just was like showing all these different aspects. I was showing the DJ stuff. You know, I was like doing all these things. I literally was just using it to showcase my lifestyle. And and you know me, like all these things, I I really do hit all these pockets because these are all the things that I care about. You have the most, one of the most authentic voices on Instagram, in my opinion. You Really? It's like a, yeah, that, thank you. Don't you don't think so? No, I mean, just, I don't know. I, I just think you're very true to yourself. I mean, I, I would like to think so. Yeah, I think that, like, to me, you you express what's on your mind. You're vi- not afraid. You're not. A, you're also not afraid to be sad. You're not afraid to be very happy. Mm-hmm. You're not afraid to just kind of be in the middle. Mm-hmm. That's why I think it's, like, that authenticity of emotions inward and outwards toward the world, which, like, I don't, you don't really see as much as, like, as we should. That's true. I think you. I agree. Where did you find that within yourself? Where did you find the ability to be open with hundreds of thousands of people? I have an anecdote. Okay. Give me your anecdote. And one of my favorite moments of our friendship, you and I, I feel like there was a very like noticeable shift in my demeanor mm-hmm. as like a person, as an entrepreneur from when you met me to now. Mm-hmm. I'd like to think so. I'd like yes. to think I've grown up a little bit. Mm-hmm. But like right in, but right before that, I think I was a little on the shyer side. Mm-hmm. And I remember you and I were in Miami. And I was always... This was your first time in Miami, right? This was my first, Hannah took me to my first time in Miami. <laughs> we had great fun. It was, <laughs> our bathroom flooded. <laughs> oh, my God. I forgot. Not in a bad way. We just got into our room and our bathroom was literally covered in water. Oh, my God. Um, I remember I had taken a photo on the beach and I was still very shy about who I was and what I was sharing. And I swear, I think I sat on the beach for like three hours debating if I wanted to post it or not. And you almost snapped at me because I think you were like, oh my God, you are better than this. Mm -hmm. And you were like, girl, we need to talk about the fact that not every moment you put up is going to be perfect. Like, wow, this is just you one day on the beach enjoying your life, put up the photo. Like, (laughs) and it was good. It was like this like maternal, like older sister moment that I needed from you where you were just like, this isn't happening every day. Wow. Please tell me this isn't happening every day. I love that you remembered that. Because it was very impactful for me yeah. during that time of my life where, see, I think for my age bracket, I'm 25. I had Instagram during college, and I don't think it really picked up until like my junior, sophomore year, maybe a little bit later than that. But before that, it was really just used as this thing for fun. Mm-hmm. I never saw it as a branding moment. And so that dramatic shift that kind of happened like within a couple months where it was all of a sudden, this isn't you for just you and your friends anymore to have fun. This is your business. This is how you are promoting yourself to the world Mm -hmm. was a very big pressure for me during that time in my life when I was starting my company. So I think I had to learn how to digest that Mm -hmm. and learn how to, um, again, take back my narrative and also control it to create the brand that I have now. Totally. I love that. Speaking of taking control of the narrative, I love to tell people like, listen, like you can really create anything you want yeah. to, want to be, what business you want to be in. Like, if there's one person who's also showed me this like, time and time again, it's Brendan. Like, he, you know, whether it's home improvement or watches or cars, like he posts like. You know, whether it's an inspo photo or whatever, which then just starts to change the narrative. Like, oh, this guy's into something like this. Like, that's cool. There's a whole world of business around just cars that we have never even explored. I've also loved, again, going back in the captions and seeing a whole new audience of people commenting and talking in his comments. Oh, my God. When he posts different photos like that. Yeah, it's very cool. It's amazing. And you really can create um, what you want to create. It's so funny. I was watching Ariel Charnas's story the other day. I'm just, like, obsessed with her children. They're the cutest things ever. She also has a great line out at Nordstrom's right now. Oh, so good. Something Navy, if you don't know about it. I'm sure you do. She's got a lot of followers. Um, But it was so funny because she was on her story and she was, like, you know, she's constantly talking about her hair. And she was on her story saying, you know what, I think I want to do a hairline. And I bet you – she got five or seven or a hundred calls the next day about how some company could help her do that, right? So, you know, 
all you need is a little bit of a call to action and then the action start happening, right? Like it's kind of crazy. I mean, I'm not saying it's as easy as it is as that, right. as that. and also she's worked so hard to cultivate an entire uh, huge audience where now huge brands are looking for women like her to, you know, help their brand lift up, etc. Right. Um but again, it's like ask and you shall receive put something out there and see the feedback like i think people also forget that instagram is also one of these tools that is such a great way of learning who your audience is like the more questions that you ask the more polls you do the more you know what i mean like the more vulnerable you are about the transparency in terms of like what the content you're looking to put out and what resonates with people and blah 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 like all of that stuff like yeah. there's people have never been willing to give up more information ever before i yeah. mean people are like spilling their Open lives books. in in a comment of course they're going to write you a dm about whatever the hell you're talking about or reply to a poll or all of these things are are, it's such a good information gathering right. that, like, you, it really is an amazing tool. It's become a whole world of communication. My scary thought these days is what what happens if if Instagram is gone tomorrow. So that one day where Instagram went down <laughs> for a minute, yeah. it really really made me think of a lot of things. Yeah, well, it made me think of a lot of things too, and it made me really think about how I can di- like even having the book, like how I can diversify more. That's not just putting all my eggs in this one Instagram basket. So let's talk about the book. Okay, the yeah, book is so exciting. Thank you. I am so curious because you, to me, are the digital queen of digital, queen of social. Like, have just hit so many different platforms. Have hit it way before its peak in my opinion you're like you're you know the og social queen thank you what was the intentional shift in going and having such a digital business and producing a physical product so that's a great question um well first of all physical product is something that i'm fully obsessed with and so here for before i can really move into the product world that i want to move into i thought it would be a good um kind of stepping stone to have a book that not only could help me in terms of like new marketing new press structure continue to like kind of hone in on that expert beauty wellness person um and it was just a really great talking point and not to mention i had all the things that i wanted to put in the book so i was like fuck it like I might as well just write this book I you know I just moved out of my 20s I'm 31 now and I really just felt like there was so much I learned over the 10 years in my 20s that I spent figuring out my health and my health journey and who I was and all the experts that I met and all the advice that I was given and things that I tried that didn't work things that I tried that did work and I just was like I need all this stuff to go into one one physical playbook where people can literally flip through and say oh my god okay here are these herbs they're good for x y and z i can make it into this tonic this will help me sleep better while still giving people also a little bit more context as to why wellness right why wellness for me and it stems from a much deeper place of there's all this stuff with my grandmother and growing up with body image issues in the ballet world and like well it wasn't like oh i'm just excited about like working out it's like wellness changed my life and the way i think about myself and the you know the positive conversations i have with myself my mind body and spirit connection is one that I I put a priority in my day. I prioritize that. And so, and I think that because of that, I've been able to be successful in, um, in my career because of all these practices that I do to make sure that I'm 100, right? So just a download of all of the things I've learned, I wanted to amass in one place that also was different from HB Fit, right? HB Fit's so much about debunking the trends and knowing what's what's going on and being the first people to talk about X, Y, and Z um, and just like being your kind of like your best friend who like is a know-it-all in the wellness world. Whereas this book is really information that I rely on daily to get through my life these are like my life hacks along with so much knowledge that I have amassed from my personal mentors in the wellness world and 
it's just like there's so much learning that I have done over the last 10 years that I wanted to share with everyone, especially now where we're in a wellness world full of clutter and full of so much misinformation and just it, a lot of people just don't know where to start. And it really does start with looking inwards and like figuring out what's going on with you because what's happening like wellness is not one size fits all like what's happening with you is not necessarily happening with someone else so what someone else is doing isn't necessarily going to work for you right so it's like how do we start to strip down all of the stuff that's being marketed towards us and really look inwards and say okay I'm going to start here and hopefully this will give me some clarity some answers and then I can move into that direction or whatever you know as an African-American woman in the space how do you hope that the industry is just going to progress further and where do you think that there are still pockets that were we're missing light. Oh my God, this is such a big topic for me. Um, I've been in so many situations recently where I have either been the only person of color included or, um, you know, like been at these wellness summits where they just so miss the mark. It's just... It's embarrassing, to be honest. It is so, I am so over this. It's crazy. Like, women of color who are in the wellness industry are, like, they're here. They're allowed. They're around. Like, they're just being ignored by these big brands who are doing all the things that are getting the media's attention, right? So it's constantly, like, these women of color or people of color are just, like, not being elevated because these big brands are not paying attention because because they don't think that I don't know I don't know what they think like do they not think that women people of color will sell wellness like I'm confused by that notion because wellness is for everyone and everyone deserves to feel good um and I think actually if you think if you look at back like systemically like people of color are have been have had so much more to deal with that they need the self-care more than anyone right and they've constantly been putting their own self-care on the back burner because they have everyone else to take care of and I will say that that's like an inherent thing that women have to deal with all always but especially women of color and it's and it's annoying and frustrating that these brands are ignoring their voices and so for me, something that I try to do on my own platform and on HB Fit is really highlight those women. Um, you know, on our YouTube, we do all of these, like, um, we, we call them, like, a couch session where we basically are interviewing all these, like, amazing um, women of color and women in general, entrepreneurs in the wellness space to put their stories on because I don't see other media brands doing that. Um And so, you know, I think what's amazing about Instagram is that I'm able to find those communities because I search for them. I really do go out of my way and I look to see, okay, there's whether it's, you know, whether I'm stalking like Latham Thomas's Instagram and I'm seeing all the people that she follows and what she's commenting on. And like that opens my eyes into people that I wasn't necessarily aware of before. And that's kind of how I am able to. Um, kind of see what's going on in that community but that's also like I'm seeking that out and I'm able to seek it out because of this but you know the brands are not curating that for us in fact they're ignoring us and I it's funny even like going through the process of the book like it's very interesting to see what brands want to get behind me what brands don't what media outlets want to cover me which ones don't and I'm not gonna lie like you know I not because I whatever, but I think I've got a pretty unique voice in the wellness world being a millennial woman of color um, who's not selling you a way of fucking like living, right? I'm telling you to live your best life by looking inward, not trying to sell you a diet, a product or a fad. And so it's very interesting to see like who's been responsive to that and who is not. And I, I think it is a little bit you know, I'm I'm pulling the race card. I think it does have a little bit to do with my race. Um, and it's very interesting. And it's, it's also been so crazy to see how, when you talk about this in your, you know, public forum of Instagram, how some of these brands just get butt hurt over it. They're like, they get so defensive. Dah, 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 dah. It's like, just own it. Like, instead of, like, 
calling me and trying to get me to retract my statement. Why don't you call me and ask me to like lead your diversity board? Right? Like just wake up. Like it's like, I don't know. I've said this so many times again, like wellness to me is not about wearing Lululemons and shopping at Whole Foods and going to Taryn Toomey's The Class. Like wellness is about the in-between moments that everyone can accomplish and do for themselves and change that the way that we are speaking to each other change the way that we're speaking to ourselves taking those moments and time for ourselves and then building off of that and it's just crazy with having such a focus on doing things that make you feel good what's making you feel good right now what is making me feel good right now um honestly everything in my life is in flux right now like whether it's like my apartment yeah you and B are constantly traveling we're constantly traveling we don't have a proper home in New York I'm on the road with the book tour so honestly it's those moments where I just even like get to have a one-on-one dinner with Brendan those are the moments that I like really am cherishing and like make me feel grounded and like I know what I'm up to because you can get lost in all the travel all the things and you know it also is those moments where I'm meeting the community face to face that I'm like all right I'm like this is like giving me peace and inspiring to me and like yeah travel is such a big part of your brand it really is it's crazy but it's like you know even just getting to bed early and drinking hot water with lemon in the morning and just like making sure that I'm like checking in with myself having a few moments like last night in the bath I was in I was taking a bath last night and I literally just like closed my eyes for like three minutes and just like literally put some intentions in the world and in my thought sphere and just kind of like said to myself this is what I'm looking to bring into my life and this is what I'm also looking to get out and just that intention setting and goal setting for me right now as simple as it sounds like those are kind of the moments that I am holding on to because I don't really have time for much else right now like I'm not getting to the gym every day you know and it's like I've kind of like let that go because there's just so much other stuff going on right now and I know one day I'll get back to being able to like get on top of my shit but like right now there's just so much other stuff going on so how can I instead of making myself feel guilty how can I set my myself up for success um and just you know ride this wave I like to always close with this question speaking of riding the wave and aiming for success but as your career progresses what's one thing that you are insecure about in your personal and professional growth as someone who's achieved success at a young age my biggest challenge is understanding and being okay with knowing that it might not be my time right? Every time I want to launch something, you know, I've like developed two products over the last two years. Neither one of them have seen the light of day. And it's because they haven't been, it has not been the right time. And being okay with that or seeing, seeing a peer, you know, a peer do so well and get what they deserve. And, you know, me wanting to do something like that, like not comparing myself, but also being so happy for my peer and knowing that it also is just not my time right now. You know, there's still foundational work that I need to do. And it's funny because I still feel like there's still so much to do on a foundational level, despite what someone else might think I've been able to accomplish. Like I still have a very large hopes and dreams. And I know that I'm just starting to take the steps to get there. And a lot of what I try and do is like reverse engineer from those goals and really say, okay, if this is where I want to be in five years, what can I do now that'll set me up for that success? Um, But again, really knowing my time and knowing that it might not be my time and being okay with that has been eye opening for me. For more, subscribe to the Friend of a Friend podcast on the Apple Podcast page and our newsletter on friendofafriend.com.